Welcome to another edition of History 1301. Um, if you've been following along with us, you will know that our economy in the early 19th century is beginning to change. Um, it's still predominantly agrarian based, but we're beginning to see the rise of industry. Now, this is very regional, this isn't everywhere, but, but certainly in the Northeast it's beginning to change. Now, the thing that I would, you know, I would recommend that you understand about this changing economy is that oftentimes, and you certainly see this in today's world of politics as well, a lot of times what happens as far as the economy is concerned will affect or is affected by what's going on politically. And certainly the early 19th century is no exception of that. I'd like to make a case for you today that the economy and its changing nature was very instrumental in the rise of popular politics. Okay, Politics that you and I would recognize today, um, behaviors and uh, initiatives, campaign strategies that politicians engage in that would be very recognizable in the 21st century. Let me put it to you this way. When you ask a politician that's running for office, whether this is president or dog catcher, what kind of car he or she drives, there's a very good chance that they don't name some elite uh, automobile maker like Porsche or BMW. Right? They, they, they want to come across as just another average American. I drive a Ford, I drive a Honda, I drive a Chevrolet, just like the rest of you. Okay, And so there's a very important reason. As a matter of fact, there's many different reasons for this, uh, and you'll see what I'm talking about here in a second. For right now, part of the reason that we're talking about this change is that there are new states that are coming into the Union. Um, states that are west of the Appalachian Mountain Range, uh, north and south, and in addition to being made up of a predominantly working class variety, um, you know, subsistence farmers, if you will, um, they are, are also passing constitutions that guarantee the universal suffrage. Everybody gets a vote as long as you happen to be a white man. Now, this is important because pretty soon the average ordinary white men are going to outnumber all of those other men of, of, of wealth, of prestige, of high learning, um, that had really been setting that political agenda for all those years. There's just so many more of them. And naturally, these individuals are going to prompt a change in terms of American politics. But let me tell you about a guy that really understood this on a fundamental level. A guy from New York by the name of Martin Van Buren. Van Buren was instrumental in the foundation of an organization that was calling itself the uh, Albany Bucktails. You're familiar with the Davy Crockett hat, the, um, the raccoon skin cap. Um, the Bucktails wore a deer skin cap and it had like a little white flip on the front of it and it kind of looked like a deer's tail, so Bucktail just kind of stuck. Um, but getting into this, what the Bucktails were at the end of the day was a political organization. They were like a caucus or what you and I would call a political party, Republican, Democrat. We're moving in that direction. Now, um, what Van Buren understands that not everybody understands just yet is you just need to get to 51% of the population. That, that's all you need to do. You've got to get to 51% of the popular vote and you win. It doesn't matter how well the public knows or doesn't know the person that you're running for, whatever it is that you're running for. If you get to 51%, it's a simple majority and you win. So to that end, in addition to making for a political organization that most people could uh, remember, Bucktail was pretty easy to remember, um, they also gave them a platform. This is what we stand for. And think about this in the context of the Republican Party. There is a platform, uh, and in this day and age, it generally emphasizes individual rights and limited government. Um, I'm not going to call that a bumper sticker mentality, but it's it's pretty easy to understand. And if you go to their website right now, that's going to be the first thing that jumps out to choose their platform. In other words, if you believe like we believe, then you should vote Republican on Election Day. Uh, the Bucktails are establishing that idea of party politics and identity politics. If you agree, if you can find something within our platform, the Bucktails will work for you once we get to Albany and we're in a position of power. 
Lastly, um, Van Buren understood the, the power of the press, a brand new invention at the time, newspapers, and they bought a, uh, uh, a newspaper entitled the Albany Argus, and they used it to spread the word about what bucktail policies were like and why you should support them. In short, what the bucktails were doing is really reinventing the political wheel, and you'll see how and why that's so important a little bit later. For the time being, I want to talk a little bit about the election of 1824. There's several candidates that's running for office in 1824, but there's really a three-horse race. Um, coming in third, uh, a distant third I might add, is a guy that's going to be a very important politician in the coming days, a guy from Kentucky by the name of Henry Clay. Clay is going to win 13% of the popular vote. Um, you might remember Clay. He was involved in the War of 1812. He had suggested this idea of a bonus bill. Uh, he used the emergency of the war to propose a, a series of federally subsidized, federally funded roads, bridges, so that our military could move around. More on him later. The guy that comes in second, although it's a distant second, would be the son of a former president by the name of John Quincy Adams. He wins uh, close to 31% of the popular vote. The guy that actually wins the popular vote is from a state uh, 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 known as Tennessee, and that would be Andrew Jackson. He wins over 41% of the popular vote. Now the problem that every one of these guys has, and we've seen this problem before, even though there's a clear-cut winner in the popular vote count, there is no clear-cut winner in the Electoral College. And similar to 1800, it would be the House of Representatives that determines the winner of this election. Now, it just so happened that Henry Clay was a very powerful voice in the House of Representatives. He could, theoretically, he could go ahead and mobilize support behind his candidacy, but you have to understand if he's ultimately elected by the House of Representatives, what that says to a more than 85% of the American public, your vote doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that I only won 13% of the popular vote. I'm going to go ahead and make myself president because I can get away with it, and I know it. His next best option to really implement the vision that he has, which is a more industrial America, which is a federal government that is more complementary of an industrial America, a more modern America, um, is to choose a candidate, choose between the two other candidates that might be more inclined to support his vision, and that is unmistakably John Quincy Adams. Um, Adams was far warmer to the vision that, um, that, that, that Clay had as opposed to Andrew Jackson, and we'll explain why here in just a second. But for right now, understand something else. Um, Clay will mobilize support behind Adams, and Adams will be elected president by the House of Representatives. And shortly after he's elected president, it comes out that Adams is going to appoint Henry Clay as his Secretary of State. I mean, very convenient, right? Uh, the guy that just so happened to get you elected just so happens to be appointed Secretary of State. This thing doesn't exactly pass the smell test. It, it, it looks corrupt. As a matter of fact, the opponents of Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams referred to this, named it the corrupt bargain, right? There had to be a, an 11th hour deal that was struck uh, between the parties involved. They had to be a, if you give me this, I'll give you that. And, and that's not exactly the way that you want to start a presidency, right? I mean, not only did you lose in the popular vote, you lost convincingly, uh, but there, there's this, um, if it's not a scandal, it's very close to what you and I would call a scandal uh, right out of the gate of your presidency. Now, part of why Clay preferred Adams to Jackson was that Adams was a lot more supportive of what Henry Clay was referring to as the American system. Now, what was the American system? Well, generally, this is a series of protective tariffs taxes on non-American made manufactured goods, probably the most important being textiles. We're trying to make Americans more competitive with the British. Federally subsidized roads. Let's get the government behind building roads uh, to make it easier to do business in America. And of course the rechartering of a national bank. Uh, people like Clay understood that credit was the lifeblood of any kind of free market uh, economy and you need to keep that bank alive. Now, we can sit here from the perspective of the 21st century and say, of course Henry Clay was right. This is smart to do this because you've got to think long term. And, you know, part of the reason that we live in a very prosperous, 
uh, vibrant uh, uh, economy, vibrant nation, is simply because this this is going to play itself out over the long term. It's going to take decades and decades and decades to unfold. But when it does, it's going to lay the foundation for a very prosperous economy. But at the same time, it also looks like what you're doing is you're using the power of the government as a tool for the very, very wealthy, right? That the rich get richer. And not only do they get richer, they get richer at the expense of everyone else. It's your, my, our tax dollars that are going to build these roads. It's the government choosing winners and losers in the American economy. I choose that manufacturer in Lowell, Massachusetts at the expense of everyone else having to pay more for their textiles. Um, this was very controversial. There's no two ways about this. And it really will give uh, Andrew Jackson a niche issue when it comes to the election of 1828. Um, hold that thought for a second. The defining issue in the Adams presidency probably comes in that final year of his first term, 1828, and the tariff of 1828. This was a tax that was put on British-made textiles as a way to make the American-made versions more competitive. I mean, obviously, we're trying to get those guys in Lowell, in Slatersville, Rhode Island, we're trying to get them started out so that they can more effectively compete with their British competitors. Um, the only problem is, this is a very regionally specific issue. If you lived in Massachusetts, you might be quite supportive of the tariff. You might not profit directly from it, but the fact that you get to keep your job, if you happen to be working in one of those factories, you can see a real, direct, tangible connection to all of this. That's what I'm trying to say. If you lived in South Carolina, however, what you see is a cost of living rise. You're paying more for your textiles, and you don't care about where those textiles are made. If you're anything like me, you don't really care what emblems on the gas uh, station sign when you go to fill up. You go where it's, where it's cheapest. Well, that's how many South Carolinians and Southerners generally approach buying their textiles. Just give me the cheap, cheapest price in town. The tariff of 1828 is going to be another one of those issues that makes John Quincy Adams seem completely out of touch with average Americans. It makes it seem as if the government is very much on, on the side fighting for behalf of people with a lot of money at the expense of everybody else. Simultaneously, Jackson had this image of being a man of the people. Okay. We remember Andrew Jackson from the War of 1812. As a matter of fact, that's really what puts him on the map. He's perhaps the most important military hero of that war, uh, maybe single-handedly responsible for restoring battered American pride in the Battle of New Orleans. Um, and if there's one thing that this country loves to do, we love to elect war heroes. And so that puts him in, in, in exclusive company in and of itself. But he's also from Tennessee. Tennessee, you know, is a fine state, but it's not exactly a state, at least in 1828, that was known for producing presidents. Um, Thomas Jefferson was from Virginia. John Adams, the father of John Quincy Adams, was from Massachusetts. Um, those were the producers of presidents, not Tennessee. Tennessee was this west of Appalachia, backwater sort of um, society, at least at that point in time it was. So he's got this, I'm a Washington outsider. I'm not a member of the good old boy network, and it ain't going to be business as usual when I get to Washington going for him. But probably the biggest thing that Jackson had going for him was the fact that he was portrayed as a self-made man. True, he was a military official, but it wasn't like he studied at West Point, right? He was an up from nothing, um, you know, self-trained, self-taught military man that just kind of came upon it naturally and, you know, developed that skill. Um, he was not born into, you know, riches, wealth, like Jefferson or Adams or a lot of presidents to that point. Um, he was portrayed as a pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Now, although it was true that he was a slave owner, so you really got to wonder about exactly whose bootstraps he's pulling to uh, make his fortune, if you will. This is how many, many, many people in the American voting public saw him. More importantly, a lot of people of the working class, even the middle class variety, saw a lot of themselves in Andrew Jackson. 
I wasn't born into wealth. I wasn't born into a position of political power like John Quincy Adams, the son of a former president. Um, I'm not a member of the Washington Inside Group, and therefore I don't really have anybody in there to look out for my best interests. This is a political winner. You get a lot of miles out of this idea. And one individual that realized that you could get a lot of miles was our good friend Martin Van Buren. He's a brilliant political strategist, and you can see a clear-cut political winner in Andrew Jackson. He's a man of the people, or at least that's the image that he gives off. And so together, what Van Buren will do is, first of all, he'll give Andrew Jackson a really cool nickname, very to, easy to remember on, on, on Election Day, Old Hickory. He was tough. He was imposing. He was hardened. He was chiseled like the Hickory Club itself, like the Hickory Tree itself. And who are you voting for on Tuesday? I'm voting for Old Hickory. That makes it easier, once again, to get to 51%. More importantly, Van Buren is able to establish a political caucus, um, much like the Bucktails, only this time it's going to be infinitely more important, more consequential than the Bucktail organization, and that would be the Democratic Party, or as they referred to it at the time, the democracy, right? This was easy to remember, much like Bucktail, right? It had a political platform. We stand for states' rights. I don't want a big federal government laying roads, you know, in Ohio. If Ohio wants a road, let the people in Ohio raise the money to build that road. Don't take money out of South Carolina or Georgia to build a road in Ohio. Um, you know, that's taxing my state for a road that I'll never uh, use, let alone profit from. So again, even if it wasn't enough that you're that, 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 you're, that you're expanding the role of government, you're, you're again, you're picking winners and losers in the American economy, and you ought not to be doing that, right? In any case, um, this state's rights combined with limited, smaller government will, will become the mantra, the political platform, if you will, of the Democratic Party really for the rest of the 19th century. States' rights, individual rights, and limited uh, government. And that, that really is going to put Andrew Jackson, the first ever Democratic politician, um, or at least Democratic candidate for president, it's going to put him in a very advantageous position. In short, the election of 1828, this rematch, it wasn't close this time around. Jackson left absolutely nothing to the imagination, and he'll win in landslide fashion. He's winning over 56% of the popular vote. Um, that was more than enough to carry him to victory in the Electoral College, and he will become president of the United States. Um, now, one last bit having to do with Jacksonian democracy. You have to understand that Andrew Jackson's election meant different things to different people. Um, to average everyday workers, uh, people like Sam Patch, for example, textile worker, it meant that it was the triumph of democracy, that even somebody that was not born into riches and, 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 and political power and social prestige, they had not been taught at places like Harvard, they too could rise as high as their talents would take them, including the top job in the land. Um, this was the great American exception to people like that. To people like Thomas Jefferson, this represented the dangers of democracy, certainly to people like John Adams, and not just because his son lost. Um, you know, John Adams was what we referred to as a conservative Republican, and I don't mean like the modern-day conservative movement inside the Republican Party as much as I mean, you know, somebody that was deeply suspicious of the democratic process, somebody that felt not everybody ought to be voting. You know, people that actually understand these issues, those are the people that need to be voting. And of course, those are people that are well-educated, or at least better educated, um, in order to make a decision on something involving things like tax laws, maybe you should have some skin in the game. You ought to be a property owner if you want to vote on these things. I mean, it's real easy to vote to raise taxes when you don't have to pay any income, not income tax, but uh, when you don't have to pay any property tax. And so therefore, to the Jeffersons, the Adams, uh, if you want a European connection to the Alexis de Tocquevilles of the world, this became the tyranny of the majority. That simply speaking, what was popular was not always right, and what was right was not always popular. 
Uh, a very good case in point would be a really popular initiative that's a, a part and parcel of Jacksonian democracy, which was Native American removal, which is a very fancy way of saying um, um, colonization. What happened later on in Andrew Jackson's presidency was the systemic militaristic removal of the Cherokee uh, Indians from the southeastern part of the United States, predominantly Georgia, and their relocation into what is present-day Kansas. People died along the way. Right? I mean, ultimately, I think if that had happened in our more modern times, we very well might label that genocide. And so this was the fear that the, the Jeffersons and the Adams and the Tocquevilles of the world had. This was the danger of democracy. Now, the simple fact of the matter is Jackson will really reshape American politics. And in the process, the way that government functions in the context of the economy, financial policies, financial programs, procedures, the role of government and all of those things will be deeply affected in, in, in a transitionary way when it comes to the Jackson presidency. And we'll pick it up there the next time we meet.